We got volume. Good. So, uh, we're doing the end of the Gospels today. We've been going through this journey uh, through the Gospels. We started 16 months ago, pretty much every week, other than maybe, what, three or four weeks off. And I went ahead and looked at the curriculum for Multnomah School, the Bible, some of the seminaries, Canby Bible, some of the Bible schools. Do you know in their two to four year curriculum, they offer one class on the Gospels? They have several on how to lead worship and how to do administration in a church and how to, what church leadership looks like and all those things, but they have one class on the Gospels. And so I would say that you guys have probably gained more in this year than some of the Bible school graduates have. So anyway, uh, that's great. Good for you. So um, we left off with the resurrection of Jesus. He appeared to Mary. He appeared to the women. He walked with two disciples, Clopas and his wife, perhaps, to Emmaus. He gave them something to eat. Their eyes were open and much similar to Genesis uh, chapter 3. And then they reported to the disciples what they'd seen. He appeared in the room with the disciples when Thomas wasn't there. He appeared in the room when Thomas was there, and he stuck his hands in his side. We didn't study that. The Bible says that he appeared to more than 500 people before he ascended. Many have fallen asleep, but some are here today, as the verse goes. Um, He then uh, appeared to the disciples in the Galilee, and that's what we're going to look at today. In the Galilee, he appeared uh, on the seashore and on the mountain uh, where he gave them what we call the Great Commission. And then next week, uh, we are done with the Gospels, but we're going to start the book of Acts, and the book of Acts starts with the Ascension. So we'll, we'll finish Luke's story of the Ascension, and he continues it into the book of Acts. We'll get a a start into the book of Acts and look at the ascension and what that meant for Jesus, the first fruits of those raised from the dead to be the first one to ascend to heaven. Um, all right, so today is the miraculous catch of fish and the Great Commission. Uh, remember, Jesus told the women to tell the disciples to go to the Galilee and wait for him. Not the whole 120, but the, the core 11. And they went, and I think they were waiting just a few days after the resurrection, and seven of them decided to go fishing. So they went out, and uh, the the text tells us that they they fished all night, and they didn't catch any fish, and then someone shows up on the shore and tells them to cast their net on the right side. I'm sure that they had not forgotten originally what happened at the beginning of their ministry, Uh, If we were to read, uh, I'll find it. It's always the one page you're looking for. So in Luke um, chapter 5, now it came about while the multitude was pressing around him. Remember he was teaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And I'd love to take you there. I, I should have had pictures One of my very favorite places is to sit on the shore and I could pick up a rock and hit one of the ancient ruins of the houses behind me and there's just uh, just a beautiful place on the Sea of Galilee but the city of Capernaum pushed right up to the shore almost to the Sea of Galilee. There wasn't probably no more room than the width of this building and Jesus is trying to teach a crowd there and they're pressing in on him. This is a town of, of several thousand people Plus, people are coming from everywhere to hear him. So I can just see him backing up and getting into a boat. And guess whose boat it was? Yeah, it was Peter's boat. And he pushed out a little way, so he had room. Uh, It says, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. I'm pretty sure that's Peter's boat and and Zebedee's boat. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitudes. Remember we said when a rabbi sat down, it was going to be more than three minutes. If he stood up, they called it, stand, teach me while I stand on one foot. It had to be less than three minutes. So I need a place to sit down here. And when he would finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let your nets for a catch. Oh, 
Master, we worked hard all night, and we caught nothing. But at your bidding, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And they signaled their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came, and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. So also James, John, and the sons of Zebedee were partners with Simon and Jesus. Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Kind of a, a, a neat little scenario. Um, from now on, you'll be catching men. There are ancient writings about the rabbis, and the rabbis raised up disciples. And they told the disciples that they would train them up, and then they would uh, fish for men, and they would catch them with their words. So this wasn't a unique statement. This was a, a rabbi calling a disciple. When he said, from now on you will fish for men, it wasn't just a cute little play on words because they had just caught fish. It was saying, come follow me. Now you're going to be my disciple. You're going to study, you're going to learn, and then you're going to catch men, and you'll catch them with your words. So it started this three-year journey, three-and-a-half-year journey, where the disciples followed him every single day, everywhere he went. When he slept, they slept. When he got up, they got up. When he walked, they walked. Um, when he laughed and told jokes, they did too, but they were that close. And then if you remember, at the uh, trial of Jesus, they were in a courtyard, and Peter was in the courtyard, and do you remember what they were standing around? There was a, a coal, a fire, it says of burning coals, like a charcoal fire. And at that point, Peter denies the master three times. And you remember we said at that point their eyes met and how that must have crushed Peter. Um, <clears throat> he had already um, tried to defend the master by cutting off an ear at the arrest, and now, but now he's denied him. It's as if he doesn't want to be associated because he could end up on a cross as well, and I get that. And I think sometimes we deny Jesus, we deny God in, in our responses to people because we are afraid of the consequences. So now time has passed. Peter's, I think he's had a rough time. He denied the master. He watched the master from a distance be crucified. He watched him hang on a cross. Word is that he had risen from the dead, but we don't know if Peter actually saw him or knew it. So he's in the Galilee. He's fishing. And they look out from the boat. Let's read that passage. Um, and they see 300 feet away someone on the shore. After these things, um, let's see, John 21, verse 3. Uh, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said, well, we'll come with you also. And they went out and they got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. You notice in the Gospels, the only other time they caught a fish was when they had the coin in their mouth. They never, ever caught another fish without the help of Jesus. I think we could learn from that. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, Children, or sons perhaps, you do not have any fish, do you? I mean, that's quite a ways. That's the length of a football field. But the, the acoustics on the Sea of Galilee are amazing. I wonder if it isn't about the same place that Peter caught his first boatload of fish three and a half years earlier. And he said to them, <clears throat> they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side, and you will find a catch. And so they cast, therefore, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. And the disciples, therefore, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Peter heard that, it, that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, threw himself into the sea. That's a long swim. But the, the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards away, and they were dragging the net full of fish, so that when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire, a fire of burning coals. 
our second appearance. It's the only two times in, in the New Testament that that word is used exactly that way, and so they link together. They got up on the land, and they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. So Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. Why 153? Did he take time to count them? Was it, was it trying to get in the Guinness Book of World Records? But John, you know John and his numbers and his mysteries and his hidden meanings. There's 153 fish. And although there was so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to him. And now this is the third time that Jesus had manifested himself to the disciples after he raised the dead. So, children, have you caught any fish? And we have the mystery of the 153 fish. And church fathers from Jerome to Augustine to many others have had theories about what this meant. I believe as Jerome said, maybe there was 153 different kind of fish in the, in the Sea of Galilee, and maybe he caught one of every one. I, I guess, I don't know. Uh, Augustine had something about mathematics, so if you take all the numbers that add up to 17 and multiply them and come up with this and that, then it was significant. Many of you might know about C.W. Bullinger. He, wrote a, he has a Bible called the um, Companion Bible. And he follows very much the, um, it was one of my earliest exposure to some of the um, Advent Christian doctrinal ideas. Um, in fact, Dean Harrell gave, gave me my first companion Bible like 48 years ago. Um, and C.W. Bullinger also has a book, Numbers in the Bible. And when it comes to 153 fish, he, and I would say this is probably, we don't know, but this one really connects with me, and it connects with a lot of scholars. He said if you add up the Hebrew phrase, B'nai Elohim, which means sons of God or children of God, the, the biblical gematria, each, each letter has a, um, a number. So bait is two, gimel is, um, I mean, noon is 50, yod is 10, he is 5, Aleph is 1, Lamed is 30, He again is 5, Yod 10, and the Mem is 40, and you add those up. It's B'nai Elohim, children of the God. Um, and if you think about it, the Matthew tells us, he's quoting, when, when Joseph and Jesus came back from Israel, Matthew linked that to the Old Testament passage, out of Israel, I mean out of Egypt, I called my son. And in the wilderness where they wandered, um, they were receiving the Ten Commandments. And they were told that if they followed God and they kept his word, they would be considered his children. They would be sons of God if they walked with him in the right way. But we know what happened. They were disobedient. They were rebellious. They, they fell away. So then we come back to um, John chapter 1. And remember, um, John starts out, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was light. And the light was the light of man. He was not the light, but he came into the world that he might be a witness of light. He came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power or the right to become sons of God. John's really good to include that in his first introduction of Jesus. He said if, he, if they received him, they had the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, they were not born of blood and flesh, but of the, nor the will of man, but born of God. So if you have a supernatural birth, you have a natural birth, you're sons of man. If you have a supernatural birth, and it's real, and it's the real deal, you are now children of God, sons of God. And so that was kind of a big thing in scripture. 
Caesar was called the son of God and supposedly was deified and went to heaven. Jesus was the true son of God. And when he, um, when we believe in him, we become true children of God. So, um, I, I, uh, 1 John, I'm going to read a couple of the scriptures here. Well, Deuteronomy 14, in the, in the wilderness, they said, For you are a holy people of the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people of his own possessions, out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. He's, he's, he's calling them the children of God. 1 John 3, 1, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, we are children of God. It has not appeared as yet what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we shall see him just as he is. He, he who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So to John, this phrase, children of God, was a big deal. And remember, we're about to close out the Gospels. Jesus is just about done with his earthly ministry And we're going to get to it in a minute. He's going to commission his disciples to go into all the world and to make disciples and to see the children of God multiply. And now they have the right to do that because Jesus has overcome sin. He's risen from the dead. He's going to ascend to the Father and sit down at his right hand. And by the way, which side of the boat did they throw the net? Did he tell them to throw the net out? The right side. I was amazed when I Googled the right side throughout the Old Testament, scores and scores and scores of times, God, God saved them with his mighty right hand. God covered them with the shade of his right hand. God is the strength of my right hand. And it's over and over and over again. It applies to a supernatural thing. So when he said, throw them out on the right side, they're going, this is God. This is from the hand of God. So little things that John loves to hide in his scriptures. But I think more important, again, that's kind of speculative, but I really think it ties together all the, all the Gospels up to this point. But we still have this problem, don't we? If you were Peter, and you had denied the Master three times, and you had turned, and you had saw them lead him off to crucifixion, and he turned and met your eyes, what would you be going through the last week or two? And now all of a sudden you're in a boat, and there he is. I don't know about you, but I think I would probably hide in the boat because I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't want to face the master after denying him before everyone and then watching him go off to crucifixion. But what does Peter do? Everybody else stays in the boat. Peter's always the one that got out of the boat. Remember, Jesus came walking on the water and Peter says, call me. Where's everybody else? Uh Uh-uh, I don't think so. And Peter gets out of the boat, and as long as he keeps his eyes on Jesus, he walks on the water. And as soon as he takes his eyes off, and he looks at the waves, and he looks at his own problem, and he thinks about his own humanity, he sinks. And I think there's such a cool lesson in that. I don't know what we're going to go through this next week, but I do know we're in the midst of a storm, and we're human, and we get frustrated, and we take our eyes off him, We're going to sink. We keep our eyes on him. He's going to hold our hand, and he's going to be with us. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But if we were to um, look at the restoration of Peter, run to Jesus or hide in a boat. And we really have that choice in life. We can say, oh, God would never forgive a sinner like me, or I'm just as good as everybody else, or I've known a lot of pretty crummy Christians. I'm not sure I want to be one of them. Or... I just don't want to give up something in my life, so I'm not going to acknowledge him. But Jesus said, uh, and John, John said, everyone who believes in him, he gives them the right to become children of God. And Peter jumps out of that boat, and he swims ashore, and there's that fire of burning coals there, which in the Old Testament represents the presence of God. So believe it or not, those coals in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest, were there according to John, to represent the presence of God. God was there with his son 
as he was going through the trial. God was there with his son as he hung on the cross. God was there with his son when he came out of the tomb. And now he's with his son, seated on his right side, the side of power in heaven. We're going to come back and look at that. But here's that burning coals again. It's almost like God said, I was a witness when you denied my son. Now I'm going to be the witness when you're restored. And so Jesus takes Peter to the side and he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, of course I love you. Then feed my sheep once. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, of course I love you. And tend the lambs, take care of the sheep. Twice. And then a third time. How many times did he deny him? How many times did he confess him? Peter, do you love me? Lord, of course I love you. Then shepherd my sheep. So what's the commission he gives to Peter? Take care of the sheep. What's the commission when God says, do you love me? Take care of the sheep. Take care of the sheep. I read this week, I may have mentioned this before, the average um, uh, adult, uh, average person in America spends uh, seven hours and 48 minutes on their electronic device, devices per day. Now you think about it, if you work eight hours and you sleep eight hours, that gives you 12 minutes for God in there somewhere after the 748. Where is our focus at? What? Let's, 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 let's think about this. Let's think about what our commission is going to be. As we start the book of Acts, he wants us to take the good news and to share it. And traditionally, we say the good news is Jesus died for our sins, and if you believe in him, you will have eternal life, and that is the good news. But let me ask you, are you better off today because you've been a Christian are you the same you would have been without Jesus, or are you worse? And I think, I hope everybody here said, man, I'm, I'm so much better off. I know it's true with me. I don't know where I'd, I'd probably be dead. I would probably be substance addicted. I would probably be, who knows? Who knows where I would be? But the real tragedy is not, it's a tragedy to die and not believe in Jesus and suffer eternal consequences. But the tragedy today is to not spend a day walking with Jesus and enjoying him. So that's the good news. And Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world and share the good news. So in the Old Testament, when they use that word good news, how blessed are the feet of him who brings good news. The good news is... Safety, the good news is the blessing of God. The good news is God is with his people. The good news is we're children of God. That's what we share to people. It's always awkward when we say, well, I should share the gospel, but it's kind of awkward to, to share about. The gospel is the good news. The gospel is what God did for you yesterday, the day before. The gospel is where you would have been had you not had Jesus in your life. That's the good news. And that's what he's asking us to share, and that's what we're going to join him in doing as we start through the book of Acts. But again, he, he said, Peter, do you love me? Because love in Greek is a feeling. But Peter wasn't thinking that way. Love in Hebrew is show me. He didn't say, Peter, do you love me? Give me a hug, man. We're good now. He said, Peter, take care of the sheep. Take care of the lambs. Take care of the little defenseless. Sheep cannot defend themselves. And Ezekiel, Karen was talking about Ezekiel. It can be really confusing, but Ezekiel 34 is very, very clear. God said, you are the bad shepherds. You take advantage of the sheep. You consume the sheep. You rip off the sheep. You don't tend them. You don't take care of them. What does Jesus tell Peter to do? What kind of shepherd? Take care of the sheep, protect the sheep, watch over the sheep, lead the sheep, encourage the sheep. Um, 
bear one another's burdens, lift up one another, admonish one another, praise one another, love one another. So Jesus, uh, either they leave from there or they meet right after this. It says again, it says on a mountain, but in the, in the Hebrew and the Greek, it can mean a hillside. I think they probably maybe went back up to where he gave that first sermon on the mount that we did so many months ago. And he sat down to teach, and the disciples gathered around him, and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit in Hebrew is the ruachani, the helpless, the needy, the ones, they're like the sheep. The ruachani will die if they don't get help. The ruachani will starve if they don't get food. The ruachani um, are the ones suffering from illnesses. They're desperate. Jesus said theirs is the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven has been, is now, and will be someday, but right now we are the kingdom of heaven. We are the ones that help them, and that's why they're blessed. That's why they're blessed. So he goes up, uh, <clears throat> and he said, from now on you're going to be fishing for words, for uh, men with words. You're going to shepherd the sheep. Um, in fact, he says at the end of Matthew, can you quote it? He said to them, go into all the world and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. I always call that, it's either the Great Commission or this Great Omission. Because we talk about going into all the world and having evangelism meetings and having people accept Christ and baptizing them, but what about that last part? Teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. That's part of the Great Commission. You go, you make disciples, you baptize them, and you teach them. I was enjoying this week. I went to the pastor's meeting, and, and one of the pastors had reported that they had had 30-some baptisms this summer, another one 20-some, another one 15. I thought... Someone said a long time ago, you'll know the health of the church by how many baptisms you're doing. I thought, yeah, that's, that's really true. There's some truth there. So God is beginning to work in our community, and we get to be part of that. We get to see when people come and go, I think I need to know what the good news is because what I'm living and what I'm experiencing isn't working out. College campuses are reporting huge numbers of baptisms because the kids in college are going, we tried that COVID thing. We tried the mask thing. We've tried the transgender thing. We've tried so many of the, the politically correct ideas, and it just isn't working out for me. And they're hungry, and they're thirsty, and they're turning to Jesus, and they're saying, I want to be his child. And John's, Jesus said, if you want to be my child, you can. So we're going to start this um, journey. And the end of the Great Commission, there's one more line. So go and make disciples, baptize them, teach them, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And it might be just talking about the end of that Jewish age when everything falls apart. So they have 40 years to make a change in the world before things really start beginning to change and the ages begin to change. And it may be talking about the end of our age, the final time. But the point is, in Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 40, I think verse 6, and it's predicting that a virgin will be with child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is with us. And so in the beginning, the Savior came, he was born, they called his name Yeshua, which means salvation, and the angels talked about Emmanuel. And at the very end, he says, go into all the world and teach, make disciples, baptize them, teach them, and Emmanuel, I am with you always. So now you'll see Peter is going to get flogged. James is going to get killed. John's going to get tortured. Paul's going to get flogged how many times and shipwrecked 
And eventually, Paul's going to be beheaded. Peter's going to be crucified upside down. All the disciples are going to die martyrs' deaths. But you know what? I firmly believe they didn't mind because Jesus was with them. They were co-partnering with him in the Great Commission of taking the good news to the world, and he was with them. Did you know, we, don't mind, we like that word, go into all the world and be my witnesses. We're going to talk about this next week. The Greek root word for witnesses is the root word for martyr. How we witness not by our words and our, by our feelings or our thoughts, we witness by our life. And we may very well be entering a time in history where it's going to come down to that. But you know what? And I've often wondered that. Why do Christians suffer so much? It's because they're being witnesses. Why don't they mind? Because he's with them. He's with us. If there's suffering, if there's death, if there's hardships, if there's breaks in relationship, if the, the grandchild is sick, whatever it is, he's with us. We can do this. We got this because he's with it. It's going to be hard. There's going to be some heartbreak. People say, why, if God is God, why does he allow so much suffering? Because he's with us in it. He suffers with us. It's this world, but there's a world to come. And he's willing to walk with us. And he wants us to go and walk with others, tend the sheep, take care of them, love on them. If you love me, take care of my sheep. Go and teach. Go and make disciples. You may suffer, but lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this um, message today. Thank you for being uh, willing to send your son to die for us. Thank you that you called us to go before you and to do some of the hard things, to take some of the risks, to finish well, to take the gospel, the good news, into the nations. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I did want to tell you, I watched this little short video this week. Some of you may have heard of Francis Chan. Uh, he's on the stage, and there's this balance beam, and he says, many of us, this is how we live our Christian life, and he lays down on the balance beam, and he, he hugs it, and he says, I just want to live in a nice, safe, gated community, and I just want to live a nice, safe life, and I just want to enjoy my life a little bit, and, 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 and when I die, I just want to die in my sleep, you know, no pain, I don't ever want to be sick, and then at the end, when it's time to meet my maker, ta-da! And the ju how can a judge hold up a score for that? Because we live the life not taking any chances, not doing our best, not being willing to, to do what God asks us to do, not giving it everything, and then go, ta-da, ta-da. I think you're going to get a zero. I want that card to come up with a 10. I want him to say, well done. Now enter in, because we got such a good world coming, don't we? So go out this week and try, try your balance a little bit. Go a little bit more.